Good morning, and I want to welcome you to the pre-service time at the First Baptist Church of Meridianville. Uh, just in a moment, we'll be scrolling some announcements about our church, and, and then ab about five minutes of announcements. Then immediately after that, uh, we will enter, enter into our time of worship. And so I want to welcome you today to the First Baptist Church of Meridianville. We are making plans to regather uh, in our buildings on June the 28th. I'll be sending something out to our entire church this week, and we'll be posting it on our Facebook page as to how you can sign up for one of those services. Today, we want to thank you that is, you have come to celebrate the Lord with us uh, through this digital means. We want to say thank you for worshiping with us today. Um, in, the, in your... Um, YouTube area uh, down below in the description of our service there are actually ways for you to respond to our service today if you're a guest with us and you want to offer your guest information if uh, you have a prayer need anything like that you can respond through our uh, through the description through links on in the description in our YouTube feed here at the First Baptist Church of Meridianville so I want to thank you once again for being with us today. We'll begin our worship time just in a moment. Good morning, church family. It's good to be with you. Let's worship together today. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus. 
Jesus whispers sweet and low, fear not, I am with thee, peace be still, in all of life's ebb and flow, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus.
Good morning. Welcome to the Sunday morning worship service here at First Baptist Church in Meridianville. We are thankful that you've come and you're joining us in our worship service, but today I want to encourage you, if you're a first-time guest, to go to that description like Brother Tommy talked about and fill out the connection card link so that we can get to know you and your family, so that we can reach out and be able to encourage you, but also as a, a church member, if you are in need of something or if there's a way that you want us as pastors to reach out to you, please go ahead and fill out that card as well. It's meant for you to be able to get information to us as well. So this morning, it's a, an exciting morning for us as a church as we get to gather and worship, but like what we do every single Sunday, we're going to spend a moment memorizing some scripture together. And so for this month, our scripture memory verse is Isaiah 26, 3 through 4. So uh, I'm going to read it for us here in just a second. I encourage you to read along with me. But as we read this passage, I want to point out some really important words to you. So let's read this passage and then we'll talk about it. You will keep in perfect peace those who, whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord the Lord Himself is the rock eternal. Let me encourage you with that word, those who are steadfast in the Lord, those who are pursuing after the Lord, who have clung to the Lord, who are clinging to the Lord in this moment. And so a part of that is showing up and being a part of the worship service this morning. So for those of us who have come to worship, to lean in close to Him as we're struggling, whatever we may be going through this week, we can cling to Him. And then we see what it says is that if we have built our trust in Him, that we can because He is our rock eternal. He is the one who is going to hold us up. He is the one who's going to keep us. He's our solid foundation. And so as everything else in this world seems to be crumbling around us, there's one place that we can turn. And forever... Our Jesus will be our rock. We can hold on to Him. We can trust in Him. And we can place our faith in what He's doing in our lives. Church, let me pray for us. And I want to encourage you, wherever you're at today, just reach out to the Lord and trust in Him during this moment. And be encouraged that He is your rock. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the uh, opportunity we have to gather, even though we're distant, even though we're not in this room together worshiping you. God, I ask that you would move among us. Lord, that you would do a work in our hearts and within our souls. Lord, because there's many that are hurting today. There's many who needed this verse. Lord, help us cling to you now. Help us remain steadfast to you now. And Lord, we ask that you would be our rock. Bring us through these days, through these hardships. Lord, help us see that we can trust you. God, we ask that you move this morning. Move in the preaching of your word. Move as we sing songs of praise and worship to you. May you receive glory from all that we do today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, go ahead. Come thou fount of every blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing. To my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious song Sung by flaming tongues above Praise His name, I'm fixed upon it Name of God
I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free. Now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has found a home. Now your grace is always with me and I'll never be alone. Come thou fount, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace. Come thou fount, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace, hear your bride, to you we sing, come thou fount of all blessings. How great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, oh. Take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Come thou fount, come thou king, come thou precious prince of peace. Hear your bride, to you we sing. Come thou fount of all blessings. Prince of Peace, hear your bride, to you we sing, come thou fount of all blessing. I was lost in utter darkness till you came and rescued me. I was bound by all my sin when your love came and set me free. Now my soul can sing a new song. Now my heart has found a home. Now your grace is always with me and I'll never be alone. Thank you, uh, music team and worship team, as we've worshiped the Lord this morning. And today, um, I'm going to share a message in dealing with the problem of pain and evil and suffering in our world. It's a very pertinent problem for a variety of reasons. And so today, um, before I move into the message, you know what I want to do, uh, as we do each Sunday. I want us to pray the Lord's Prayer together. So I would ask you to join me to pray the Lord's Prayer this morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today we're going to take a break from our series in the book of Acts and talk for a while this morning about the problem of pain. Uh, you know that we are in pain this week in, in our church. Our church has experienced a tragedy as uh, Katie Trent, 32 years old, uh, died in an accident. And so we as a church are in deep grief. The Trent family is in deep grief over this situation. Several other church members are struggling with difficult news of various types. Uh, they are in pain. Um, I just recently got a call. Just a few minutes ago, I received a call that, that uh, a family that's been attending this church, that one of their loved ones is about to die in the hospital unexpectedly. And so I'm leaving after this to go and be with that family. Um, and so this morning, when we talk about the problem of pain in our world, we often ask the question, where is God when we are in pain? And and more importantly, why does he allow pain anyway? It's an age-old question. It's been around forever. Some 3,000 years ago, a man named Asaph penned a prayer in the Psalms. He talked about how he had become upset over the evil in the world. And this is what he said in Psalm 72, verses 2 and 3. But as for me... My feet came close to stumbling. My steps had almost slipped. Well, why, Asaph? For I was envious of the arrogant as I saw the prosperity of the wicked. As Asaph looked upon his world, he saw all these people who were not walking with God, and yet they were prospering. He said, for there are no pains in their death, and their body is fat. In other words, they're well fed all the way until the time they die. And Asaph said, I don't get it. Bad people prosper, and he prosper at times, while good people suffer, and he alludes to the fact that he is tempted to envy them. It's a, it's a form of the question, um, why do bad things happen to good people? Or where is God when it hurts? Um, there are entire theology books written on this subject uh, uh, there are entire seminary classes dealing with the, 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 the theology of pain. And today we're going to, to cover, cover this issue in about 30, 35 minutes. And so today as we think about this, I'm going to give you an overview of the issue. And then I'm going to give you some basic biblical truths on how to help people who are in pain. Because after all, that's the most important thing. Uh, yes, our theology is important, and it's vital, and we better have a, an understanding of how this world operates according to this book, but we also need to know when we come into contact with somebody who is in pain, what's the right thing to say? What's the right thing to do? And we'll talk about it, that at the end of this message. Well, the first of all today, as we consider the problem of pain and suffering in our world, um, we have the problem of bad things, the problem of bad things. We have bad natural events, bad health events, bad uh, untimely accidents and deaths. And then the problem of sin and evil. You have all sorts of, of brokenness in our world. Um, the first issue would be what I would call bad events, bad natural events. It's what insurance com companies call acts of God. Somewhat like the, tor actually totally like the tornado outbreak of 2011 uh, when uh, there were 362 tornadoes, um, 348 people died, 238 people died in the state of Alabama alone. I think of that event in 2011. I think of the Japanese tsunami in 2011. All these people suffering. So you have bad natural events. And people ask, where is God in that? Then you have the problem of bad health events. Our world is filled with bad health events um, in which people suffer. Uh, we ha obviously, we immediately think of cancer. We think of dementia. We think of diabetes. We think of things like muscular dystrophy that often affect children. We think now of COVID-19 and all the people that have died as a result of that. The list of serious health issues is, is almost endless. 
And in undeveloped countries, it's much longer because it includes illnesses that are easily preventable. Some 400,000 people die every year from malaria, which is completely preventable. Uh, one of my brother-in-law's best friends died a few years ago. He had contracted leukemia. He went through a bone marrow transplant, and he had a perfect match with one of his siblings, and everything looked like it was going to go well. People had prayed for him. Everyone had rejoiced with him that he was doing so well, and then suddenly things turned, uh, turned into a bad situation, and my, fr my, my, my brother-in-law's good friend died. And he, he wrote a letter to their family, and this is what he wrote. He said, we are in uncharted territory, for we have entered a world without John in it. This, that is a vastly diminished world. Many questions. Where, what does it mean? How in the world did we get here? Why did John have to suffer so much? Uh, even after special ceremonies were held to commemorate milestones in John's journey when it seemed he was getting better. Then my brother-in-law writes to the, to the family, to the wife and to the family, I do not know, I do not understand, I do not have answers, but this I do know, every prayer that was offered for John is lodged in God's heart, never to be forgotten by him. And so we have the problem of bad health events, and then third, we have the problem of untimely deaths and accidents. Accidents occur all the time. Over 16 million automobile accidents every year in the United States. Over 100 people die every day in the United States. Uh, we think of what had happened with Katie this week. Uh, I think of my own father and grandmother who died from uh, a truck accident and an automobile accident some nine years apart. Um, there are all sorts of untimely deaths and accidents occurring all throughout the United States of America. Just this week, just this week, there were two naval aviators. Between them, they had over 6,000 hours of flight time in military jets. They were flying a small plane in South Alabama. There was an issue with the, with the engine of the plane and the plane nosedived, and both of those men in the prime of their lives died as a result of that accident. And so we have untimely accidents and deaths, and then we have the problem of sin and evil. That's a wide category. It, it takes in everything from a teenager who told a bold-faced lie to their parents last night about what they were doing uh, this, past week, this past weekend. It, it, it entails things like that. It entails that um, this past week in Morgan County, Alabama, just about 40 miles from where I'm standing right now, sadly, there were seven people who were killed in a home, shot to death in a home in Morgan County, Alabama, not far from where we are. Memorial Day weekend, there were 10 people murdered and over 40 injured by shootings in the city of Chicago. And then all of that pales in comparison to Adolf Hitler's killing machine in World War II, which, dealt with, which led to the, the, to the deaths of six million Jews. But due to what Japan and Germany did in World War II, um, I've read that est estimates up to 80 million people died as a result of a few powerful people in Japan and in, um, in, in Germany in World War II. So certainly we live in a world with a host of problems. And people throughout our world ask the question, if God is good, why does evil exist? Why does death exist? Why do accidents exist? Why does pain exist? Why do terrorists exist? Why do tornadoes exist? Why does illness and disease exist? Those are some of the most difficult and thorny questions that people have debated over the centuries. In Christianity, uh, there are two primary approaches as people seek to answer those questions. And the two approaches I will call theology A and theology B. Theology A is a theology that I don't agree with. Theology A says some people believe that God micromanages everything that occurs even to the point of causing sin and suffering. 
Uh, there are some in, our, in, in Christendom who believe this. They, they believe there is no free will. They believe that some people were literally created for heaven, but they also believe that some people were literally created for the specific purpose of going to hell. They also believe that everything is scripted, that, that God has written a script for everything that occurs on this earth. Uh, this theology says that every millisecond of every day down to the cellular, cellular level of what's happening in our world, God is the great puppet master of everything. That's a convenient theology because it gives you an answer for everything that happens. If you stub your toe, God did it. You contract cancer, God did it. You get drunk and kill someone, God did it. Everything that occurs comes from the hand of God. Though that's that theology in nature, in accidents, and in man's choices. Um, they would not say that God simply allows things. People in, with this theology would say that God causes everything that occurs. Everything comes from the hand of God. I actually preached a funeral uh, many years ago in which several children died. I was the second preacher in the service. There was a preacher before me. And the preacher before me stood up, and I could not believe He had this theology. I couldn't believe it because the, the, the children died tragically. It was, it was horrific. And this preacher stood up before me and said that, that, that everybody should be, have peace because God had caused what had happened. And I, was, I got sick to my stomach because I was sitting up there on the stage. I thought, what in the world am I going to do? And I stood up and I basically I rebutted. I, 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 I took God's word and I refuted everything that previous preacher said. After we went to the graveside, a television reporter came up to me because it, the, this was a a widely known uh, event when these children died and a television reporter came up to me and asked me to roll my window down and I ro rolled my window down in my car and she said can you believe what that man said before you spoke and I said I, I heard it and she thanked me for basically uh, correcting his theology that day I actually heard one guy teach and preach and he he literally said from a, from a pulpit that Hitler was part of God's plan. The extermination of 6,000 innocent people. Uh, I asked the question, what kind of God does those things? Not the God I serve. Um, the Bible tells us that God is love, 1 John 4, 16. The Bible tells us in James 1, 13 that God is never involved in evil. He never tempts anyone. The Bible tells, my Bible tells me in 2 Peter 3, 9 that God wants everybody to be saved. And so I personally reject any theology that states that God participated in the Holocaust of the Jews, that God leads anybody to abuse anybody, that, that God creates people for the express purpose of sending them to hell. I reject any theology that says that God gives people cancer or Alzheimer's or muscular dystrophy or anything like that. The God I serve sent his son to the cross so that the entire world would be saved through him. The God I serve does not afflict millions of people with various diseases every year so that they suffer. That's not the God that I serve and I don't believe it's the God that the Bible teaches us about. I believe that God is great, but I also believe that God is good. And so that leads me to theology B. Theology B uh, is this. A sovereign God, that is a God who is in control of everything, a sovereign God has given man a free will. And therefore, while he allows sin and suffering, he does not cause it. This is the traditional view of Southern Baptists like me. It's the view I hold. This view acknowledges that God is sovereign, that he is in ultimate control, that he can stop this earth anytime he wants, that he can stop anything that's occurring on this earth right now. He is sovereign. He is all-powerful and all-knowing and all of. That's what sovereign means. 
Uh, in his infinite wisdom and love, however, he did not create robots who would have to love him and who would have to serve him, who would have to worship him and who would have to obey him. And so he gave man free will. We see it when Adam and Eve were created in the Garden of Eden. Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you shall surely die. And then we read in Genesis 3, 6, When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband, and he also ate. God's Word tells us that, that Adam and Eve were given a command, and they deliberately chose to break that command. They exercised their free will. And God's Word tells us, with that choice, with their choice, sin and death entered the world. You say, where does God's word tell us that? Romans 5, 12. When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. And in this theology, these are the basics of this theology. In this theology, man has a free will. And therefore, when Lord Jesus told the rich young ruler in Matthew chapter 19, verse 2, Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, Go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. In this theology, the rich young ruler literally have a, had a choice. He was not scripted to, to uh, reject Jesus. He actually had a choice. He had the free will to make a choice. I can either follow Jesus or not. Uh, in this theology, people choose to accept Jesus or choose to, to, to reject Jesus. They choose whether or not they end up in heaven or hell. So in this theology, man has a free will. But also in this theology, God allows sin but never causes sin. In this theology, God is sovereign. He is in ultimate control. He does miracles. He opens red seas. He causes the walls of Jericho to fall down. Uh, he can raise a dead man called Lazarus. Uh, he can choose to intervene and stop any person from doing anything. God is sovereign. He can overrule his creation at any point because he is God. But God never uses his power to create sin. James said it. And remember when you're being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong and he never tempts anyone else. Um, and so at this point I would say, that uh, just because God allows something does not mean God caused something. Just because God allowed World War II, just because God allowed Pearl Harbor, just ca because God allowed Hitler to kill six million Jews does not mean that he literally caused those things. At this point, someone might ask, well, why didn't God prevent those things? Well, the truth is, if God prevented all bad things, we would be robots. If God put a protective bubble around every Christian, everyone would have to be a Christian. It would overwhelm man's free will, and God is not going to do that. In this theology, God wants everybody to be saved. Um, John 3.16. In this theology, John 3.16 is true. For God so loved the world. He didn't just love a select group of people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but should have eternal life. In that previous theology I talked about, uh, those individuals would believe that Jesus only died for the, quote, elect. He didn't die for the whole world. In this theology, we, believe, we take John 3.16 at face value. We also take 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 at face value, where God's Word says the Lord is not slow about his promise as some count slowness but is patient toward you not wishing for any to perish but for all to come to repentance and so in this theology god wants everybody to be saved but then fourth in this theology the world the natural world is broken because of sin in romans 5 12 
When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. As a result of Adam's sin, death entered the world, and the natural world was affected. Um, and so, for that reason, aging occurs and death occurs. Why? Because sin entered the world. In this theology, even God's creation was affected by man's sin. Do you realize? Do you realize? In the, about, in the hour and 15 minutes or so that this service will, in, that will take up, in the hour and 15 minutes, approximately 8,000 people will die in our world in a variety of ways. In this theology, infants like our daughter, Amy, die prematurely at times, not because a sovereign God caused her to die, but because we live in a broken world. Certainly he allowed it, but that does not mean he caused it. In this theology, accidents occur that cause death, not because a sovereign God caused them, but because we live in a broken world, a world broken by sin. Um, in this theology, a sovereign God allows man to exert his free will. In this theology, God is active in our world. Um, God is at work in our world every day, every minute. He performs miracles. He opens red seas. At times, he supernaturally prevents tra tragedies. At times, he supernaturally heals. At times, he supernaturally extends life. At times, he intervenes to thwart evil. And at times... He does not intervene. And in those times when he does not intervene and the tragedy occurs or the infant dies, as in the, the case of me and my wife, or the young father dies like my father or the young woman dies like Katie, in those times we lean on the sovereign knowledge and the sovereign love of God. Uh, do, we not, do we understand why God did not intervene in those circumstances? No, but we know that we can trust Him. We know that in His sovereign understanding of how this world had to operate, in His understanding, in His wisdom, and in His love, He was ready for those individuals to be with Him. Um, and so... When he does not change the situation that we want changed or does not prevent a tragedy that affects us, we choose, we make a choice to trust him. Um, third, um, a Christian's response to the problem of pain and evil in a broken world. Well, first of all, we would say that God's plan is perfect. We don't understand it because we're not God. In Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah and said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God's ways are perfect. They're beyond our ability to understand. God could have made a sinless, robotic world where nothing bad ever happened. But God chose to create free human beings who could submit to him or rebel against him. And I hear somebody saying, but look at what it cost us. And my response would be, look at what it costs God. In Romans 5, 8, God's word says, oh, the, um, but God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I was talking to someone today about when Jesus was on the cross. And we were talking about sin and suffering in our world. And this individual was talking about how much God must have suffered when his son was on the cross. And, and my response was, I feel that and I understand that because of this. I said, I believe that when... When the world went dark when Jesus was on the cross, I personally believe that God Almighty just said, you know what, i got to turn out the lights for a while because this is too painful. This is too painful. Um, this morning, we have to understand that God's plan is perfect. Years ago, I 
I heard about a man whose son died in Vietnam and he was speaking to his friend and he was saying, where was God when, when, when my son died? Where was God when my son died in Vietnam? And the, the friend gently said, uh, he was in the same place that he was when his son died for you and for me. God's plan is perfect. But then secondly, God's provision is overwhelming. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, the apostle Paul wrote and said, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Um, God's provision is overwhelming. One day, one day, um, all that we have suffered, all the grief we have suffered, all the pain we have suffered, all the rejection we have suffered on this earth, all those things will be, in a sense, um, overwhelmed by the goodness that we experience in heaven. Several years ago, I sat with the Stallings family at Huntsville Hospital as Abby's father, Harlan Goolsby, uh, was just about to pass away. Uh, Abby's mom and dad had been married 59 years, and as I stood there by Abby's mom next to this next to this husband that she had been devoted to for 59 years uh, she said um, who will I watch the Braves with in the evenings who will I watch them lose with now as I knelt by that bed she patted her dying husband's hand and said they say they say these are the golden years but then she looked at me and she then she pointed head, heavenward and she said, they were wrong. Those are the golden years. Speaking of heaven, those are the golden years when we are together in heaven. Uh, the Apostle Paul says, if you compare the two, if you compare the difficulties of earth and the grief of earth and the pain of earth with the glory of heaven, the Apostle Paul says, there is no comparison. Paul says no one will get to heaven and complain about how much they suffered on earth. And so, you say, well, Brother Tommy, all that theology is well and good. But Brother Tommy, when someone that I love suffers, what should I do? What should I do? I'll give you a couple of things. First of all, pray for them. In James 5, 16, God's Word says, The effective prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. The old saying is true, you cannot do anything more important than pray, than pray until you have prayed. And it is true, intercede for them, stand in the gap for them, do spiritual battle on your knees for those who are suffering. Pray first and then serve them. Clean their house, mow their grass, buy them a meal, take them a casserole. Uh, don't ask them if you can. Just do it. Serve them. In cases of grief, um, if you're tempted to offer ex ex explanations, thinking that you can make the situation better, um, I would encourage you to just not offer explanations. Sort of keep your mouth shut. Um, here's the deal. When our daughter died, some well-meaning soul wanting to, to comfort me and Laura said something like that God needed a flower for his garden, therefore he took our daughter. And Laura said, you know what I wanted to tell her? I wanted to tell her, how would you feel if God picked your flower for his garden? Like, God wants to destroy my world so that his flower garden will be prettier? That's not helpful. Here's the deal. Even if you have the, the best, most godly, and insightful answer on earth as to why somebody went through something, 99.999% of the people who are suffering don't need it. They're grieving. They don't need some spiritual sounding answer most of the time. They do need you to listen to them. They do need you to talk about their loved one even if they cry. They do need you to remember special days like birthdays and anniversaries. They do not need for you to offer your, your explanation 
as to why you believe their loved one died. And fourth, learn the value of just being with them. When someone's suffering, there is great value in simply being with them. The Bible says that we are to to rejoice with those who rejoice and to weep with those who weep. And part of weeping is just being there. Just your presence, just being at their house, sitting, not feeling compelled to even say a word. Uh, one of the most important lessons I learned in seminary was from Dr. Joe Coffin. He was a, a, one of our professors. He said that when his granddaddy died, he said he was about 10 years old. And they lived out in the country in Mississippi somewhere. He said, our preacher came to our house where everybody was. He said, everybody had shown up at the house. He said, our preacher came to our house. He said, he came up on the porch. He came in, opened the screen door and went inside. He gathered us all. He said, he prayed a very humble and simple prayer. He said, and then after he prayed the prayer, he said, he just went out on the porch, went out on the porch and sat in the porch swing while people came and went to my grandmother and my granddaddies. He said, as a little 10 year old, just our preacher being on the porch, just his presence brought me a sense of comfort and peace that he was there grieving with us and praying for us. One of the most powerful, I have, what, what I've learned is when someone goes through a tragedy, when someone goes through any kind of grief, when someone goes through a significant loss, there are two things, pretty much two things to say. The first thing to say is, I love you. The second thing to say is, I'm praying for you. You can flip them. I'm praying for you and I love you. Either share those two things and then just be there. Be there for them. Um, and then finally, finally, keep the memory of their loved one alive. So often when someone goes through a, a, a difficulty and they lose a loved one, we, we want to tiptoe around on eggshells like, we don't want to do anything to make this person cry. Guess what? The best gift you can give them is to talk about and to celebrate their loved one who is no longer with us. And so even if it makes them cry, it's like solid gold when you are willing to enter in, into someone's pain and even be comfortable with their tears and say, I remember this about Joe or I remember this about a Cindy. I, I remember this about Pete. I remember this about Karen. Uh, I remember, I remember and to share those precious stories. Uh, you want to help people? You want to help people? Celebrate the gift that their loved one was. Um, this morning, as we come to the, to the close of this service, we have to acknowledge that we live in a, in a very difficult world where a lot of bad things happen. But we also have to acknowledge that we serve a sovereign God who is a good God, who knows the, very the number of hairs on our head He loves us that much. And he is there to help us through our times of difficulty and pain. And one day, one day, this world will be a distant memory as we are in heaven with him. I want to thank you for being with us today. I'm going to close us in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. Some of them are in difficulty right now. Some of them or in grief right now, and the grief may have been from three or four years ago, or longer, or it may be very current. And Father, we thank you that when we go through difficulties and grief, you tell us that we can call you Abba, Father. We can be like the little child that crawls up into his parents' lap and says, oh, Daddy, I'm hurting. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the only God, that you're a compassionate God, and that you shelter us under your wings. And today, we need that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to thank you for being with us in our time of worship here.
at the First Baptist Church of Meridianville, Alabama. God bless you. Have a great rest of your weekend.